Hello everyone, many greetings. Thank you very much for being present in this live streaming from Tibetan Buddhist Society of Canberra. Uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> is a regular Sunday uh, practice session. This morning uh, I will not be uh, doing long chanting or meditation. Uh, I'll go straight uh, after the prayer to the talk because of uh, uh, time constraint I have. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, we have this uh, talk session. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, um, and um, take a couple of moments to, uh, when I do the refuge, uh, try to see what's safe way of being and thinking and perceiving and uh, responding we usually draw our resources from. As a person who is inspired and have the karmic affinity to follow the way of the Buddha, the Buddha Dharma, uh, it's always good to renew our Huge. It's very easy to lose the steps and stray off the path. That's because one doesn't have the good discipline to renew and and really revalidate the refuge in the triple gem. So it certainly is uh, true for many people. So oh, I'm making some sense there. So I will do the um, the refuge uh, validation of affirmation of refuge uh, and confidence. In in one's leaning on the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, and the practice of altruism, and always loving kindness, uh, compassion, uh, as the most important remedies there is to allay difficulties, whether it's personal or interpersonal or social or, or whatever the scale of the difficulties are. It's always go to the safe uh, practice of being kind to sentient beings. Like His Holiness Dalai Lama says, it's my religion kindness. So if you can practice kindness, then and then usually you are being gentle towards yourself and all those around you. Whatever the circumstances that were before that is all completely different. It's a non-issue really because it's like being able to extinguish the fire. So don't let the fire burn at all when you have the extinguisher uh, uh, with you. So, so with this in mind, I'll do the refuge. Yeah, 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 yeah
Tanya la never your happiness and the cause of happiness. Be free from suffering and the cause of suffering. May Once again, greetings to you, everyone. Today, this morning, I'm going to talk about the uh, importance of the role of language in Buddhism. Uh, of course, um, this is uh, relevant in the sense that uh, uh, Buddhism is such a uh, kind of old uh, teachings, so to stretching back 2,600 years ago, and uh, teachings are given then by the Buddha are uh, as fresh and vibrant and relevant, uh, uh, like a panacea to all those who actually get to know the gist of the Dharma. So it's important to know the, the role the language has played uh, and will play and should play. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, the, the, it will, I wanted to clarify some misgivings or misunderstanding people have about, the, about Buddhism being kind of uh, uh, divided because of the linguistic originality which, uh, and also uh, dispute uh, or argument whether uh, in what language Buddha taught or, or did not teach. So this kind of uh, argument uh, seems to be based on what people didn't know about the Buddha, uh, uh, let alone the language that he spoke or he was able to communicate. And then the subsequently, why does the, um, uh, yeah, why, how did the Buddha Dharma actually stayed in what form of language? So it's more like a, it's a very much like a cultural uh, kind of a, a perspective of Buddhism uh, based on uh, the people's leaning on to one language, uh, at least uh, one ancient Buddhist language, uh, at least, and uh, how important it is. Mm, firstly, uh, uh, Buddha is a fully enlightened one. Buddha is fully enlightened one, and uh, an enlightened one. Uh, even on the, even those those who are a rich on a few first few of the first uh, per, 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 first few, first few of the preliminary stages of the Bhumis when they reach enlightenment, they're able to uh, read people's mind and uh, remember past and uh, able to communicate uh, um, people of many uh, backgrounds and interests and uh, languages. 
so it is oh, it is quite clearly mentioned that some of the uh, attributes or qualities of in uh, arhats and others are uh, exceedingly so high so therefore to question what buddha could teach in one language or less no, no more than one language seems like a, such a disrespectful thing to for people to think uh, whether buddha uh, buddha taught only in uh, one a kind of a vernacular of his home or or, uh, or in actual actual magada or or varanasi or or shravasti or or the um, whatever parts of india he he uh, he whatever he taught uh, to say that uh, buddha taught only in one language such as pali and did not teach anything in sanskrit or to say vice versa that buddha taught uh, i don't think there is anybody saying buddha only taught in sanskrit uh, but it seems like whoever are saying that buddha taught only in one language and therefore that language is more sacred than others uh, have to uh, have to understand what are you talking about are you talking about a buddha as a monolinguist uh, who only l- learned to read and speak in the language he was brought up and didn't learn any other languages so that's one assumption already is too uh, too bad even to assume that uh, uh, that i do not speak more than my mother tongue is uh, is a quite a quite a big assumption for instance i speak four or five languages uh, to s- assume that i could not teach in more than one language is already a uh, 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 already a big big false let alone thinking that buddha could not uh, have taught in more than one language is such a uh, such a uh, exp- such a kind of proof of the person's lack of any understanding of the qualities of buddha as far as i know the buddha one so enlightened one could teach in many languages not just many human languages but the languages of the devas and asuras gandharas yakshas rakshas uh, humans and the demigods and uh, even animals and so on so therefore to say that buddha could not teach uh, could not have taught uh, uh, in more than one language is being very very disrespectful if you if you're a buddhist that's a quite a sacrilege to say buddha did not teach in more than one languages whether you are whether you think that he only taught in pali or any other language you are you are not only disrespectful to the others who learn buddhism from other languages but you are actually going being this very disrespectful to the very qualities of of the buddha qualities of the buddha has a f- physical qualities verbal qualities mental qualities enlightened activities qualities and his qu- other qualities so this we talking about linguistic quality is only one of the five qualities of buddha to say the buddha did not teach buddha only taught in pali and not in sanskrit or prakrit or abhabramsha all of those 720 languages that uh, that was a uh, uh, widespread in his day in only in indian subcontinent but buddha would be able to uh, is said to have communicate in every single languages of not just humans but also all so therefore let's not uh, uh, assume make a wrong assumption that buddha taught in pali or in sanskrit and that the thinking that uh, the all the text uh, other than in one language that you are adhering to uh, is not authentic is a uh, is a great show of one's ignorance and being disrespectful to the buddha to say the least um uh, uh, so these days uh, therefore as a result of these prejudices about uh, uh, language uh, this uh, this emphasis that the on uh, the buddha was a monolinguist and all his teachings are only in one language uh, and we don't know where the others got from we don't really trust the texts that are in sanskrit or others is a sheer arrogance uh, so to that is also create schism and uh, and a bias between fellow buddhists who may uh, rely on some different language than than you and i rely on say pali or sanskrit and so on 
So therefore, let's not uh, uh, assume that Buddha was uh, a monolinguist. Buddha, Buddha was definitely polylinguist. You know, he was able to speak in every languages, not only in different languages. Everybody will hear in the languages they are best suited to, but different temperament, different intelligence, different kind of teaching are tailored. Everyone hears ex- differently, exactly to suited to the mentality of theirs. So is the quality of Buddha. Sung jing ni tu sung mo ji tuma ni tu so so ko. He say in this this quotation, even though Buddha spoke one word or one sentence, but everybody will hear as numerous as their liking to their temperament. So therefore, uh, it was some of the enlightened qualities of the Buddha to be able to communicate the teachings, not just because different languages, but he can teach simultaneously himself as multiplying as as many as thousands uh, in different places and different languages, different topics. So to say the Buddha didn't teach Mahayana, Buddha didn't teach uh, Vajrayana, uh, and so on, is to sheer disrespectful uh, to the qualities of the Buddha. So if one is just happy to follow one form of Buddha's teaching, that's fine. But to think the Buddha could not have taught more than this, I know, in our little couple of books, is uh, very small-minded. Uh, so so that's, I thought I'd say that because uh, uh, there is some kind of a Pali kind of Buddhism or Sanskrit Buddhism. These days people say that, which, is, which, is, which seems like a, um, uh, because these days uh, there's hardly any uh, ancient Indian language in which Buddhism is preserved. Uh, there is a Pali Tripitaka uh, that is uh, preserved, uh, not because Indians preserve, but because Buddhism spread in other countries uh, like in Sri Lanka or, or any Southeast Asia where Buddhism spread and there uh, they mainly rely on the Pali language and they were very, I would say, very, very orthodox in terms of adhering to that very language um, because the, uh, I would say, Theravadins uh, have uh, relied heavily on uh, keeping that uh, Pali language as the sacred language uh, to preserve their practices, prayers and teachings in Pali language, uh, even though they, these countries like Sri Lanka or Thailand or Burma and Cambodia and Laos all have their own script, but they're all written, uh, they're all based on the uh, the Indian kind of uh, alphabet, uh, mostly like 30, 16 files and 4, 34 consonants. So you can see, uh, uh, so the Pali, both Pali and Sanskrit uh, have, have may more similarity than dissimilarities. Uh, to treat one as an authentic language, language in which Buddha spoke, the other as a not, uh, will not help to, to, to develop respect and credibility to the overall uh, Buddha Dharma. So therefore, um, when the, uh, the teachings of the Pali Tripitaka, Tripitaka in the Theravadin countries are all in Pali, we respect that, uh, and therefore uh, you can even see that many, many of the words in, in Pali languages are, are almost like a you can see the obvious derivation or corruption of uh, one of the other. Because when we say dharma, they say dhamma. We, in Sanskrit, we say karma, they say kamma, and, and so on. So the, there is a close connection. There's a, almost like a little bit of dialect. There's a different dialect. So even in India, you go these days, there are quite people who can speak half a dozen dialects. And to, to think that Buddha didn't, did only speak in one dialect and not the other dialect is a is a, is a is a not a, not a right thing to do so th- so therefore sanskrit the other language is sanskrit sanskrit is language of the devas or create very very meticulously created the grammar of which is some of the uh, you know high cause of high caliber of the language sanskrit grammar uh, so the sanskrit uh, the, all the buddhist texts that are that were in sanskrit and were then translated because the people who followed the mahayana buddhism were a little bit further away from indian subcontinent so they they include china 
and Japan, and you can see Korea and Tibet and uh, and Mongolia later. All of those who follow Mahayana and Vajrayana, they have all of their <coughs> their texts uh, to have been translated from Sanskrit. You know, so uh, so. The, but uh, if you look at the Buddhist language, uh, Buddhist literature that are preserved in Sanskrit, or that are that are translated from Sanskrit into say say Chinese and Tibetan. And and uh, Vietnam, Vietnam, Vietnamese, as well as uh, Korea, and so on. If you look at, they all have uh, drawn their teachings from the Sanskrit language. So therefore, uh, to 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 dismiss the, all the teachings in Mahayana Buddhism because they're in Sanskrit language. Uh, and not accept them as authentic is probably based on one's lack of understanding of the language, let alone the contents. So that shows how language is so important. Uh, so therefore, in the old days, people who mastered uh, uh, more than a couple of languages and who were able to translate, uh, they were they were called loka chakyu. Loka means world, chakyu means eye. They are eye of the world because they can see the completely other world that this person who speaks only one language cannot see the world so without learning the language you don't know anything about it about the people and their their their, their thoughts and their civilization so therefore the people valued very highly those who have the mastery of a more than a couple of languages and then being able to translate the teachings into uh, their own native languages mm, native languages uh, so uh, buddhism has all Mahayana Buddhism and Vajrayana Buddhism tantric texts all have uh, are believed to have been translated from Sanskrit. Uh, Sanskrit, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, when you look at the many many of the Mahayana Buddhist uh, uh, sutras, uh, and all the uh, majority of the sutras that there are, there are sutra and Abhidharma and Vinaya that are in Pali are all in 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 Sanskrit. So it's not that they are they are producing something completely that doesn't exist at all. Not only the Mahayana the Sanskrit kind of uh, language-based Buddhism has all uh, of the mm, Tripitakas that are found in Pali, but they have three more, three or four times more uh, uh, texts and teachings uh, that are not found in the Pali. Pali. So therefore, therefore, you can see that what the what the Sanskrit uh, people who follow the stream of Sanskrit language follow Buddhism, they actually had the advantage of not only uh, having all the text that is in Pali in Sanskrit and Sanskrit translated into their language. So and they have they were, therefore they expect and respect the, all the teachings that are in Pali because they could they could actually see it's in the in 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 their own languages. So. They Therefore, when they hear about the sutras mentioned by P Pali scholars, they know exactly what they're talking about, and they have no difficulty respecting that as authentic teachings of the Buddha, because they don't think that Buddha only taught or spoke one languages and and could not have taught in any other languages, and they basically dis dismiss that. They they don't do that. Uh, they don't do that. Um, so therefore, interesting thing is these texts were translated in early. As second century, because Buddhism spread through China as early as second century. That's like six hundred years after Buddha passed away. So the so the Mahayana teachings and text uh, existed in India uh, um, as early as Theravadan teachings. It's not that the Mahayana Sanskrit-based Buddhist uh, language teachings on, came later. No, it's not like that. Buddha taught them all during his same lifetime. You know, only the um, only the Theravadan Tripitaka based. Uh, this, uh, the Theravadan la literature related uh, practices, which is mainly monastic, monastically oriented practices, um, they are more widespread everywhere, whereas Mahayana and Vajrayana was only practiced and given to a limited audience and therefore was kept fairly, fairly uh, kind of uh, up, uh, to those very groups who were, uh, who were chosen to practice those. So therefore they were not uh, widely, uh, widely 
uh, spread, I suppose. But it is interesting that Sanskrit based, Sanskrit language based Buddhism uh, was uh, uh, that actually have incorporated Mahayana Buddhism, which I call the, the inclusive model, whereas Theravada is more like exclusive model. It's, it's exclusive because even in language, they only think it's only this language in which Buddha taught. And not only that, the form of practice they do is mainly monastics. It's designed for people who are who only few who were able to renounce family and the world and so on, which is highly admirable, but only few can do it. Therefore, they become behaviorally very exclusive, linguistically become inclusive, and, in, and their intellectual also become very inclusive, exclusive in terms of ex, ex, and then rejecting the, all the others as being not even teachings of the Buddha because they don't know the language, let alone the contents uh, in them. Whereas Mahayana Buddhism, which is Sanskrit, I would say base a stream of uh, Buddhism, uh, is much more inclusive because it's inclusive because all the teachings that are in, in the Sanskrit-based Mahayana literature, uh, are, um, uh, uh, when they see them in Pali, they, 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 they accept them as also Buddha's teachings. Uh, and, and I don't think there's any Sanskrit scholars who, who says Buddha didn't teach in, uh, in Pali, it was only in Sanskrit. Uh, that kind of language-based language bias is very unhealthy. But one should, uh, in, um, should one should imagine Buddha was um, like polylinguist. He can speak in every language, in every tongue, every wishes and interests suit to the everyone. So it is said that Buddha could speak all of them, teach according to the liking of everybody, not just the language, but the, that which actually communicate go directly to the heart where the person need to hear. So when we talk about the um, uh, inclusive model, uh, Buddha has himself was very inclusive. His teaching was for the all sake of all sentient beings. Therefore, he, could, uh, he would have to t- t- talk in the l- language of the birds, language of the humans, language of the uh, deer. Because when, when Buddha gave the teaching of the first sermon for in Dharma Chakra Paramatana Sutra in, in Sarnath, his main audience was not humans. They looked like five monks, but they were mainly deer, so the deer park. So he was teaching in a directly or indirectly to all languages of everyone. Probably quite a few of us then were maybe were, were those deer. So therefore to say that Buddha was on exclusively speaker of Pali language or Sanskrit is, is not healthy. It's, it's, it's very divisive. So therefore in this particularly globalized time uh, when we are learning Buddhism through maybe uh, secondary languages like from Tibetan or Chinese or, or Sinhalese or Thai, they are, they are heavily relying on Pali or they're heavily relying on Sanskrit. And they have a mother language from which Buddhism was translated. So all the Buddhist terminology, when, San, when, uh, when Sanskrit uh, or Pali was translated into various languages, uh, those uh, scholars and linguists of those days who actually went to India and mastered the Pali and Sanskrit, Abha, Brahmsha, Prakrita, all the languages, uh, languages they, when they translated into their languages, uh, they would have to adapt uh, the, the, their, their written language to cater for the actually Sanskrit and Buddhist Pali languages in order to bring all the thoughts of Buddha without any kind of danger of being lost. Like the Tibetan Buddhist, Tibetan language, uh, although there was a, a other, the actual spoken and written language before the actual Buddhist Tibetan language uh, in 7th century, it was said the king asked, sent his minister to Misambhota into to India to master the Sanskrit language and so that to invent a written language or to adapt the Tibetan language so that we can ably translate all the uh, Buddhist terminologies and ideas without uh, losing uh, losing at all into the Tibetan language. So they put lots of emphasis in mastering languages. And because Tibetans spend a lot of time mastering the Sanskrit languages, uh, they have great reverence to, uh, to, to Sanskrit languages or a language of India. They don't call it, they don't call Called the, the uh, Sanskrit uh, language Sanskrit, they call it language of India. So, uh, because India has many languages, it obviously have to respect all the languages. And we, it even says that in India had 720 languages, of which four majorities are what we call Sanskrit, uh, Pali, uh, Prakita 
and Abba Vramsha. Yeah. So Tibetan actually, ex- Tibetan Buddhists actually accept the the four major languages of the day during the Buddha's time. Not only they accept all of them, but they have no doubt about Buddha being able to teach in all languages, of all levels. This is very important because when you don't know more than the language that you know, your world of knowledge about the other world is completely blind. And but those who know the language, uh, one language more than one language, uh, they have a completely different un- understanding of the other, 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 other side. Like when I read Bali, not that I know know the uh, grammar of it too much, but I could understand a, a good, a good high percentage of it because of similarity with the Sanskrit. I have immense respect uh, in uh, the the Bali Bali uh, literature and uh, Bali text society and their work and read translation uh, and then uh, but when we know this all the Sanskrit uh, Buddhist text has been largely lost uh, was because the countries that translated Buddhism uh, from Sanskrit into into Chinese and so on they were thousands of miles away from India therefore for them to do the all the chantings and do the things in Sanskrit would be unthinkable it's quite admirable that by the Theravadin countries uh, uh, when they do the most of the prayers and things, they and, uh, they can do in Pali, but uh, but it seems like a more classically they do in Pali. But the majority of the devotees don't know what the hell is to her going about. They don't know the meaning, and um, so they they just believe in the sacredness of the one language is is preserved, but not actually understanding of it. So that's quite quite a quite a devastation, really. Not understanding meaning, but only keeping the form. Whereas those who who were distant, far distant from India, uh, countries like China and Japan and Tibet, mm, when they brought Buddhism, they definitely translated uh, all the Sanskrit texts into their languages. With the exception of few terminologies, uh, like uh, names uh, of the text or names of the, they didn't translate. Some they tried to translate, but they, uh, the phonetics and everything become uh, like like it is said. The word the Diana, the Sanskrit word Diana, uh, were uh, they did not translate that, and they tried to keep that into, into into their attempt to say Diana, for instance. Then the, it said the Chinese called Diana Chan Buddhism. And then the Japanese who, go, who learned from the, their next door neighbors from Chinese, they couldn't even call Chan, let alone Diana, and they call it Zen. So this shows how the how the how when you when you when you try to pres- uh, speak a language that is your not your mother tongue, and then you end up saying the word not only incorrectly and do not know the meaning whatsoever. And so, therefore, many many of the uh, Mahayana Buddhist countries, majority of Mahayana Buddhist countries, don't learn Sanskrit because it's not possible to learn. But in Tibet, we had quite a handful of people who did master Sanskrit, and that's how they translated. And sure, sure, uh, people like Xuan Zhang in China also did that. They were they mastered the language, and therefore they were able to translate into Chinese. And so, uh, therefore, these days, when when uh, academics study Buddhism, uh, they actually have to uh, be able to read at least one of those ancient languages, Tibetan, Sanskrit, or Pali, or, or, or classical Chinese. Classical Chinese. Um, uh, so there are other other kind of uh, Asian languages uh, too, but uh, in these these are the main uh, body main language in which many of the Buddhist literature was translated. So Buddhist scholars who can read classical Chinese and Sanskrit and Tibetan, uh, if they can read all of those, at least two of them, then they have a great uh, inroad to master the master actually Buddhist texts. But if they become just an, uh, and they only read, read one of the, two, the Main Buddhist languages, and they have not a lot of advantage to be a scholar. Even those people who who think that they are Tibetologists or they have PhD in Tibetan Buddhism, very few these days. They are they very few of them are eloquent, and let alone let alone um, uh, let alone they, they could they couldn't speak freak, uh, they couldn't speak fluently at all. They speak probably very broken uh, Tibetan, which would be which would which would not. Uh, 
to be regarded as scholar at all, you know. Uh, but yet, because they can translate in their, into their native language, like English or French or Japanese or whatever, of course they could be some uh, professors or whatever. But actually they're reading and writing, even worse, uh, they can, can, can hardly speak. Even the people who were like, they were like a couple of hundred uh, Tibetan, Tibetan lodges nowadays meet together, international you know, association of uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhist scholars. There's, a, there's a hardly, hardly any number of uh, um, foreign uh, Tibetan scholars who could speak fluently in Tibetan, yet they're all uh, claiming as a great scholars in Tibetan Buddhism because their, their actual mastery of the language isn't so good. They're only relying on many other Indo-European translations and footnotes and so on. So their research is mainly based on that. But the actual um, uh, reading the Tibetan script and uh, translation, is there seems to be much better quality than actually being able to speak the languages. So uh, the main thrust of today's talk uh, is about the, uh, the, um, the importance of of uh, opening our eyes about the uh, uh, re respecting and mastering languages, uh, particularly the languages like Tibetan <coughs> is more living Buddhist language uh, than Sanskrit is. For instance, Sanskrit, uh, while it's uh, good to have um, ability to read and so on in Sanskrit, but actually most of the texts in Sanskrit Buddhism is lost. There are not anything left to read, you know. Even those few that are, are are being recently restored and readapted and 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 so on. So therefore, uh, the because Sanskrit is a not not a, not a very widely known spoken language, it's a, uh, uh, what His Holiness Dalai Lama called dead language. Uh, of course, there's a couple thousand people who maybe read and write and even speak Sanskrit, um, particularly among the among the Varanasi area, but the rest of the uh, uh, rest of the people who think they know Sanskrit, they have no time they use it as a language at all to speak and communicate. They may use it simply to research their work and study, but actual language in which the, the Dharma is alive is the people who speak and read in the language and then they are practicing Buddhists. So that's why these days people come to realize if they wanted to study Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism, and also do comparative study of some of the sutras that are in Pali. They can read of some of the sutras in the Tibetan. They will see exact, exact kind of a, a copy of that, uh, and uh, sometimes even more accurate than any of the translations in other languages. Because Tibetan has not only uh, spent a lot of time to uh, royal patron under royal patronage, not they never translated under one scholar. One scholar never translated it. One Tibetan tra translator, Lord Sawa, never translated on his own. He always translated. In collaboration with the with the, with the Sanskrit Indian Pandita, when the the the, the combination, the collaboration between Indian Pandita. Uh, and the Tibetan Lotsawa uh, worked together. There were none of this idea of my work and his work type of academic kind of a, uh, possessiveness of uh, translation being mine and work being mine and that kind of thing. They were all underdone royal patronage. They were all done with a very strong religious zeal. And there was no none of this academically oriented, ego-driven me. Uh, I'm the owner. I'm the, uh, the kind of or, or owner of this work or this translation. Because of not having that, made the whole translation from Sanskrit into Tibetan uh, a very uh, a labor of love. It didn't become a labor of who can get more grant because... Uh, uh, because because they have published few books and and not actually willing to work and uh, work with uh, uh, anyone or teach the basic language to recruit new students for which on which he or she might have a, some kind of credential having PhD on something but never willing to teach from
from the scratch to recruit students from the undergraduate level all the way to uh, uh, all the way to postgraduate level. Very few um, scholars are wanted to do that kind of real love of labor work. They only were more interested in their own research work and in, in which they can travel or or whatever, but not really willing to recruit students so that these students are actually able to step into the very positions uh, that they are trying to teach from. So when, when they, if there isn't that kind of tradition of rearing the student to write from the undergraduate level to teach uh, those uh, strong Pali or Sanskrit or Tibetan based languages, uh, the Buddhism, Buddhist teachings will not really pro advance very well, uh, very well uh, to the actual benefit and the cause it has. But those who him individuals who, who get a uh, piece of paper called certificate uh, because they because two two just academics uh, read and passed that text they might get a position but actual service of the what was Lotsa and Pandita working collaboration is almost non-existent in today's scholarship so therefore those who who are Buddhist uh, scholars and or intending to contribute actively to the uh, uh, through their through their knowledge and skill, which people do have, it's just the intention. People talk about how mindful people should be, but we should be more mindful with our right kind of intention. Why one is doing the study? Why one is doing the academic work? If one wanted to really contribute to the furtherance of the furthering of the teachings of the Buddha, then the language is very important, and you should. If you are, if you know one more than one or two uh, Buddhist languages, such as say Pali or Sanskrit or Tibetan or classical Chinese or Japanese, you should teach people from scratch, uh, 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 either either under your academic kind of a, a discipline or separately. So then people can say, I, I, I such and such professor, he mastered these languages and he taught me this, and you will have actually student who actually grew uh, and could actually stand in there and then do make a valid contribution to the uh, ever, and, uh, ever, ever sort of necessary uh, scholars who have actually a knowledge of uh, more than one languages in Buddhism. Today in this world, of course, most, uh, um, um, most people uh, can do many, many things on the basis of English. But uh, if you go in Europe, they want to make you to master German or French. If you don't have master master in German or French, you could not really do ma advance much in your research, let alone teaching uh, in that language. Even though your student might still do their do their thesis and work in 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 in, in English, uh, but there much of the many many good good research has happened in Japanese or French or German German languages. And if I, one is not willing to learn those languages, you can't. Now, if today's world, today's only few few world world scholars uh, work is impeded by a lack of their language and knowledges, then how much more it will impede them if they do not learn themselves Sanskrit, Pali, Tibetan, and classical Chinese. So that's why, of course, uh, when we talk about uh, non-linguist Buddhist students today, even for them, uh, some of the terminology, whether they're Sanskrit terminology like Dharma or Karma or Buddha or Sangha, some of them which are not translated even into English, uh, there will be many such terms which require, which which still need to be taught, and including in the Vajrayana Buddhism. Uh, Although people may not be interested in learning any Tibetan or Sanskrit, but they have to know what the seed syllable is and what the vowels are, what the consonants are, because they come up so many places in the visualization, in the meaning of the deities, and there are certain syllables like pam, you know, what is pam associated with the lotus, you know? And if you don't know the word padma, the pa, uh, like say a word, or a Sanskrit word for lotus is, is padma, 
Padma, uh, then you, you have no way of understanding the significance of Pam. It says if something is generated from Pam, a lotus is generated from Pam, you don't know what the hell is. And they don't also explain. But if you, know, if you have a, at least a little bit of linguistic background of Padma, pa, uh, Pam is the uh, Pam is because P is the first syllable or first initial letter of the Sanskrit word lotus, and therefore the seed syllable Pa, which is consonant, plus the 15th vowel Um, uh, uh, these two therefore creates the, the method and wisdom aspect of the vowel and consonant, because the, the consonant is the method and the vowel is the wisdom, yeah, in, in uh, vowel is in the wisdom, we, when we talk about the gender in, in vowel and consonant. So usually uh, um, uh, vowels are all feminine and, uh, and the genders are all consonant, uh, are all, sorry, sorry, uh, consonants are all ma- masculine. And so, uh, because no word could be uttered, no, no, not even one syllable could be uttered without the ex- union, union of compassion and wisdom, or method and wisdom, consonant and vowel. And so, therefore, you can actually explain the word Pam, lotus arise from Pam because P is the initial of the word Padma and so, and so on. And so therefore, the little bit of lang- la, the, the language and uh, of Sanskrit and Pali or Tibetan is a necessity for people who, want, who are studying Vajrayana Buddhism and doing um, deity yoga meditations and practices and all the symbolism. All of them are hugely based on the language and the culture from which Buddhism came from. These days people call Tibetan Buddhism because they think that's that's the, the but actually it's not. Tibetan Buddhism has very little Tibetan in it. It has everything to do with Indian Buddhism. Everything to do Indian Buddhism because India hasn't kept uh, kept anything uh, except ruins. Uh, even that they couldn't didn't know where the thing was except the British archaeologists dug them up. India has completely sort of forgotten their uh, their their their, uh, their heritage, um, some of the heritage, Buddhist heritage at least. I'm talking about um, because they they didn't know. Uh, so therefore, these days the practice of the Buddhism that is in Tibet. And uh, is called Tibetan Buddhism or Chinese Buddhism, but actually, if you really look at the language in which they are, they are they have the text translated, they all translate from India. The Chinese went to India, Tibetans went to India, and Japanese went to India, and so on. All of them went to India to to study, the master the languages of the day, and then then they uh, study un- at the feet of Indian teachers, and then they sometimes invited those teachers back to China and Tibet and then in collaboration with them, then they translated the text. In Tibet, these texts that are translated in the 7th, 8th century were all revised in two centuries later by many, many scholars of the day and they revised, edited and then finalized. And so went through very meticulous uh, correction, edition, recorrection, edition uh, and some of the great law, so translator became a uh, great reviser. Their job was just to revise. They always checking someone else's translation. So the people, the Buddhist teachings uh, and the languages, people who are language have to work in collaboration, helping each other. Not because we are friend to each other, because the cause of his or her work is going to re- benefit many people. So therefore, the revision uh, or not just translation, not just draft translation, but but the final translation has to still be revised by other not by the same scholars. If that kind of collaboration is not happening, that's why then the texts and books are, um, are not translated from any languages, uh, but people quickly attend some teachings, type everything, and then write what they thought it was, and quickly publish under the name of His Holiness Dalai Lama. They said His Holiness Dalai Lama wrote 140 books or something. I don't know when he wrote them. <laughs> But there are actually a lot of a lot of uh, quick note takers and transcribers that did this, and some of even my books are like that. I I don't have time to sit down right, no 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 no. I have the great skill of authorship, but uh, these days we have so much uh, literature being produced in Buddhism, uh, but very few uh, institutions are actually devoting their time to the translate the very original text that are in Tibetan. In 
into uh, the languages. Why? Because we don't have the willing collaborators of between academics and sc uh, translators, scholars for whatever politics, or whatever financial, whatever cultural, whatever kind of things are impeding uh, this activity, which I think is a, a great shame. Uh, and so uh, any organizations or individuals who are, who are helping and, uh, and advancing these activities, of course, are also happening on a smaller scale. But uh, the individuals themselves quickly producing very voluminous books um, and, uh, as their research work, there are, there are heaps, uh, but, uh, uh, and whatever, whatever sort of uh, goes, so to speak. But, but, uh, but uh, t today to say that, that the Pali Buddhism and Sanskrit Buddhism, I don't think that's a really useful way to distinguish the Buddhism like that. It doesn't need any linguistic bias. It should be, it should be, it should be all looked as a general Buddhist teachings, uh, what, whatever, whether they are in Mahayana countries or whether the Theravada countries, whatever. They look at what is general, uh, what is monastic Buddhism, uh, like at the Vinaya, what is academic, well, the, um, the, what, what is the, what academic study, what are the actual culturally orientated Buddhist people actually study and do the practices. For instance, you, when, you, when you attend any Theravada and Buddhist uh, Dharma activity, you can see them, they're all chanting in Pali, which is a very nice tune, and so it's good. You know, you can do the chanting in Pali, particularly the refuge and a few things like that, uh, and which everybody seems to know by heart, and, and, and beyond that, that's about it, really. The rest of the books is just to sit there in the shelf looking beautiful and holy, but that's it. Who reads them? Because the, uh, who reads them? And because they are in some ancient, ancient languages, like, like Christians think it should all be in Latin. And uh, so when you have that, uh, that, that because the person's knowledge of language is so limited, he or she only leans on that languages because they think they follow that text and they don't have any understanding knowledge of the other Buddhist teachings done in other languages. Because in those days, people thought anyone who's lived on the other side of the river or other side of the mountain were foreigners. And likewise, anyone who spoke different languages, they were not you. Or anyone who, who looked different skin or racial. Or, but we are not in that world anymore. We are in a globalized world, one big family. So therefore, particularly Buddhists, are such a small percentage of people follow Buddhism. We should all not become uh, linguistically divided uh, by being Pali, being Theravadin, and Mayana being Vaj Mayana being sort of uh, Sanskrit based. Uh, even though the text may, be, may have that leaning, but we should still see that the language that we do not have many things that you would be surprised Prize that you think they are not teachings of the Buddha. If people have that, that means they are blind. They're blind because they don't know the other languages and not their culture, not the history, and a lot along the teachings they also follow. And if you if you open your eyes, which is a very nice thing to do, um, of the world of the fellow other Buddhists, like like a, like a couple of years ago when His Holiness Dalai Lama was attending the World uh, World Religious Congress in in in. Melbourne, he had a meeting with some of the senior uh, Burmese monks who were attending the Congress, and when they had a brief discussion of a few things about Buddhism, when His Holiness Dalai Lama talked to them about the Vinaya, the Burmese monks was, was, was very surprised that Tibetan Buddhists, Tibetans had Vinaya. They thought Tibetan was a mixture of Hinduism and shamanistic born religious practice. They never a respected or a, a, a thought that Tibetan have Vinaya whatsoever. So this kind of prejudice, totally blind. When His Holiness just uh, spoke briefly about the, about some of the nitty gritty details of the Vinaya, list of the vows for the Parajikas and so on, and they were so surprised that His Holiness had any knowledge of the Vinaya because they have completely assumed that there was no Vinaya in Tibet whatsoever. So that kind of prejudice. Um, um, uh, and saying the Mahayanas think the Theravadins are all the selfish or they only want uh, liberation for themselves. This kind of attitude is very wrong, you know. Uh, this, uh, this kind of is a diff just different models of attitudes, how we practice, but not, should not be divided by language, should not be divided by geography, should not be divided by col color of robes or the language in which they are done. So that's why it is very important to 
to know more than one language, uh, language. Um, if, if it does, it completely opens your eyes and you become much more greater, great embracer of the big world for one family rather than dividing us and them on the basis of the language and the world that you don't know. And part of the reason division between Theravada and Mahayana is also that, unfortunately. So therefore, fellow, uh, fellow Mahayanists and fellow Theravadins uh, should actually uh, sit down and then look, uh, some, talk about some of the common features of Buddhism that they follow and uh, not just live in the assumption what they think the other, other people do or don't. Uh, you become, you'd be very pleasantly surprised uh, that we all follow the same uh, precious Dharma of the Buddha. It's all take refuge in the Triple Gem, all except the four seals of Dharma. What are the small lineages uh, and the names of the figures of the founding fathers? Fathers of the different lineage got it. Nothing. People are celebrating the anniversary of their own small lineage that started a couple of hundred years ago in a big way. But they don't want to celebrate a Buddha's um, anniversary of the Buddha's uh, part, uh, uh, enlightenment together with the fellow Buddhists all together and organize it under that fashion, what is more generally relevant to everyone. This world needs un, uh, unity and work together, not just between fellow Buddhists, but even with other people. One of the main teachings and requests of His Holiness Dalai Lama's uh, the vision is to, for, for people, believer or non believer, all should come together as one humanity and work together. So, to do that, if we are divided over languages and who text, which text you read, which text you don't read, like the, some of the Tibetan philosophers schools. It's so miserable. You can see all the polemic writings. a complete waste of time. They lived in a very small little valleys and they never went outside of the valley or never crossed that mountain ridge and they thought everyone on the other side ridge is the other mob, you know. That kind of limitedness made us stay so backward and not understanding the world and you are quickly invaded by the other because that's you you, you spent all all inside inside that valley and only thought your dialect was the con only thing and your race was superior over others uh, others haven't got right this kind of blindness of not knowing other culture and language has caused huge division so that's why it's really important to uh, to firstly appreciate the buddha uh, how much how wonderful it is that he talked Dharma in in languages of all countries. Now, whoever studied Dharma in there from the from through Thai or Burmese or Pali or or Khmer or or Korean or Tibetan from their teach, they all you can see they all are getting the Dharma. They all believe in the truthfulness Dharma uh, like nothing uh, that uh, anything could match that. You can see that it has nothing has lost. The teachings of the Buddha is just as relevant and a medicine it is now uh, at, as it was then. Why? Because these people who studied the language, original language, translated in there, have passed into like that. So therefore, one can, one who understands the, the role of the language and uh, uh, and more, role of benefit of learning more than one language, actually makes your eyes open, and therefore you you have a, a you not only rejoice your fellow Buddhists who wear differently and and do different. Ways of Buddhist practices, but you also realize how enlightenment of the Buddha, how how he could tailor so many teachings for, to suit people of different temperament, different cultures, and languages. Wow! Then your heart will grow as big as the world. Not really stay small-minded in your own little, little ethnicity and little linguistic background, and and becoming so prejudiced to those who are others. Like we see some Buddhists, like in uh, like in ACT, you know, even. The people of the Theravadins, whether the Thais or Burmese, or, or, or they also don't want, they don't agree even the shape of the temple, and therefore they couldn't work together. <laughs> that kind of that kind of division is such a uh, shows the how how uneducated these people are to, uh, of the other uh, styles, and let alone appreciating them, and could not um, uh, could not rejoice and do it together because they they they, they, they that's just as they look. They 
that we are superior, the others are not quite right. That's because they don't know language and the culture. And the translation and text in that language is just exactly the same as the text translated into your languages. You'd be pleasantly surprised that uh, people of different orientation, whether linguistic or ethnicity, also uh, have the same refuge they have in the Triple Gem and not therefore bring down the Buddha, saying Buddha didn't teach any, anything but Pali or Sanskrit, which is, which is such a, such a shows the limitation of those people, that shows their own limited nature of their knowledge. So I thought I would say this because there are, there are these... There are these groups of people who, who think the Sanskrit Buddhism, Pali Buddhism, uh, and, and it's more, much more than that. We need to. Uh, there are many many languages during which, uh, of which in which Buddha's teaching are still preserved, and quite a lot of like even for some Vajrayana mantras. When we look at how some are in Prakrita, some in Sanskrit, some in other languages, uh, we have you know they deliberately made it in that way, um, so that people could not easily go and decipher the meaning of the text without the, uh, the guidance of, uh, of a person who know the, uh, the text and the meanings. Uh, so therefore, the, in, in India, there was a quite capaci- great capacity to work many languages together without, without any kind of seeing one superior or others and saying all the texts that are only taught in Pali are genuine, the others are not. That kind of view is so unhealthy. Uh, that's uh, all to do the vice versa. Versa, you know, um, when I read any Pali text, I every word I rejoice and believe, and uh, there's no uh, then the thought never comes to my mind. Buddha only spoke in my language. Why? Because because to think that is a is a very very a very very um, very very demeaning to the Buddha and to oneself and one's knowledge of it. Whereas to th- rejoice the multiplicity which which with Buddha has taught and reach many people um, can uh, can. And therefore, make us to rejoice uh, all the various strands of Buddhism that are all there, no matter how different, how different ethnicity and language and culture, and they do, they are, they all have the same refuge in the Triple Gem. Wow, this is so great! And therefore, we we become uh, you know, not different Vyanas, not different Vyanas, Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana. These are not different schools. These are just different thoughts, and thought can change in your own head. Quarter one moment to another whether you're emphasizing a renunciation or whether you're emphasizing bodhicitta or whether you're renunci- emphasizing in, in transformative vajrayana model. Uh, so therefore, it is, uh, the, there's a different, these are just different methods, different methods to, to remedy the same problem that you might have. Some things you might have to renounce, like a renunciate monastic practice of the Theravada propagates. <laughs> Uh, uh, sometimes you might have to embrace the very problem instead of running away and pushing it away. So, like the Mahayana way of, of, uh, of inclusive model, uh, and a, a Vajrayana model is neither uh, you know, rejecting one or including another. It doesn't see the difference at all. All are due, caused by the duality, and when you nullify the duality, you transform the difference between between I and the self and the other, and all are. Like the big space, you can't divide the space into a couple of uh, portions and saying this is this is that. All space is one, and uh, Vajrayana has a very, very, very transformative way of trans- transcending the, all the dualities. So therefore, these are not just schools; these are different ways of a method that actually uh, relieves the very suffering uh, that the whole Buddhist Buddha Dharma is uh, taught to to the cause the ending of. Um, so with this uh, we, I'll stop here today um, today is the uh, last day of the uh, uh, last Sunday of the, the Sagadawa uh, so thank you very much for joining me and I'll do the dedication of merit thank you oh Da da 
Mas dela vaza Jehoda Mahayana Jeje Kareja Manjuje Nyawadin Azama Tabara Jelawa Walawe Ode Zambo Aja Jedege Ode Mere Meda Zalambo Dijida Tebewe Erhana Yaraza Er has been Bome Jinger Freely with the generation. Thank you, everyone. Catch you next time.